you go. All right, very good. Hey everybody, welcome to day four. You made it. Super excited for you to be here today. Today we are going to be doing financial analysis. I'm gonna start laying the foundation of a financial analysis for how to analyze a multifamily building. So, day four challenge. Here we go. Let me share some screenage. All right. Okay, so this is what we're gonna be covering today. Now, of course, the reality is there is the layers deep that, that things go in real estate investing is, it's huge, right? There's so much to learn. My objective for you guys for this five day challenge was to, one, help you like have some kind of catalyst to get going, to get started, to get the ball rolling and lay enough of a foundation so that you can actually really start learning and making some moves and, and getting the ball rolling. So today we're gonna be covering like the, the absolute core things of a financial analysis for multifamily. So I wanna start with teaching you just some of the common terminology, net operating income, all right? So if you're in the two to, fam the two to four family uh, sector of your financial analysis, you won't always see things laid out this exact same way but the calculations are still the same. So the terminology is more about uh, like five plus units, but some of these things are gonna apply with your lenders, even if you're looking at a two unit or a four unit or a 40 unit, the same way. It's more that the vernacular from real estate agents and brokers is more used in the apartment sector than in the small multifamily with these things. So I tell you that only to prepare you so that if you're having a conversation with someone, and you're, especially if it's an agent that's not super uh, specialized in doing investment properties and you say, oh, what's the cap rate? And it's a duplex. It's not that cap rate is not relevant. It's just not used as much in the residential sector, sector which residential is considered one to four units. So anyway, but you can still use it because even if you're starting with two to four units, you're moving into apartments eventually. That's like, that's your end goal. So you might as well use it, understand the vernacular, understand how to actually do the calculations now, because they're still relevant now, but you really wanna be able to speak fluently about these things as you go forward with your, your journey. All right, so net operating income is one. Cap rate, which is short for capitalization rate, is another. And all these I'm gonna define, I'm gonna give you the calculations for these today. Um, cash flow is one, and then debt service coverage ratio is one. All right. I think the weather change is making me uh, have allergies or something. Never had allergies before though. So, all right. Sorry to share that, that much intimacy with you guys. Just shows you I truly love you. All right. Okay. Let's go. So let's get working on NOI. Okay. So net operating income, the way it is referred to in the business, rarely do you hear people say it out, net operating income. You'll hear me say it out because I'm usually uh, in educator mode. And so since a lot of people don't know what it is yet, I don't tend to use the NOI, but when I'm talking to brokers or anybody in the industry, I don't say net operating income. It's a lot of syllables. It takes a lot of time to say it. NOI. All right. So NOI is what, what it's called in the industry. And that is basically taking your revenue less your expenses. So if you relate it to just a regular business, it would like be taking the profit and loss statement and it's just the bottom line. It's just the bottom line. All right. So the only thing that's not included in NOI is the mortgage payment. And in multifamily real estate, we refer to that as debt service. So it's the revenues, it's all the rents coming in. If there's any other financial um, revenue, like storage revenue, um, what else could it be? Pet rent, anything like that, that's all revenue. Expenses are like property taxes, insurance, maintenance, property management, things like that are the expenses. And then what's left is net operating income. If you had no mortgage payment, your net operating income would be the cash flow. Okay, so just kind of put it together that way. If you have a mortgage payment, and usually people do because you're trying to best leverage, but you don't have to. Some people prefer to do things cash, just own it outright and maximize their cash flow. No problem. NOI would then be your cash flow. All right, so that's important to know as you're talking and you're doing your analysis, you're probably gonna have a mortgage payment. But when you're calculating NOI and you're comparing from property to property, that that isn't part of it. It would skip over that. Okay, the next is cap rate, all right? Also known as capitalization rate. So the cap rate we get by taking the net operating income, 
so revenue minus expenses, and we divide that by the purchase price. All right, so what that shows is it's, it gives you a relationship between how much net income the property produces compared to how much the seller is asking for that. And the higher the net operating income compared to the purchase price, the better, right? That means it's more profitable. So if you have a building that's selling for 500,000 and it has a net operating income of $50,000 a year, that would be a 10% cap rate because it's NOI, 50,000, divided by the purchase price or the offering price of 500,000. So that's at 10%. Now let's say that the asking price was 600,000. So I actually don't know what that is in my head, so let's calculate it out. So I would take just basic calculator, 50,000 divided by 600,000. So now it's an 8.3% cap rate. So just you can just think logically, okay, well, paying 500,000 is obviously better than paying 600,000 if the income is going to be the same, right? So your cap rate, the higher the number is, which it's always shown as a percentage, the higher that number is, the more profitable the property is. And in general, and actually talked about this yesterday and Freddie brought that up, you want to be shooting for 8% or higher. When I was new in real estate, the kind of the going conversation was that you really want to look for 10 or more, but it's 10, a 10% cap rate has just become less and less uh, frequent. So if you're holding out for a 10% cap rate, you might be holding out for a very long time. So sometimes it's better to go into a building that has a lower cap rate, but you have, you can see that some of the uh, the units are under market, so you could raise some rents, or you have an opportunity to decrease expenses, or in some way, increase the net, net operating income. You basically then can buy it at a lower cap rate, and then raise the cap rate just through your own activities of getting the financials to look better. All right, so cap rate is a major, it's a major measurement in the multifamily area. All right, the next two are cash flow, and DSCR, debt service coverage ratio. Okay, cash flow and debt service coverage ratio. So cash flow is super simple. It's just the net operating income minus the debt service. Okay, so net operating income minus the debt service. And I wasn't planning on doing this in this, uh, this five day challenge, but I think I might pull up the calculator that I've done in some of the little financial analysis master classes and just kind of show you guys how this pull through. Because we know there's not a lot of teaching on this. It's more, let me give you the basics and then go do it. But I might just kind of give you a visual demonstration in just a minute. Uh, sorry, I was just thinking about as I'm showing you this, I think that's gonna really help to solidify things a little bit more. Um, and then debt service coverage ratio is the net operating income divided by the debt service. I was like, wow, okay, what does that even mean? So debt service coverage ratio, it is the relationship between how much income the property is bringing in, and I say income, I mean net income, compared to how much the mortgage payment is. And so where, where is this relevant and who cares about that? Your lender, when they see that you have X amount of cash flow coming in, they want it, or net operating income, they want to make sure that that is sufficient to pay the mortgage, right? That's what they're, that's what they're concerned about. They want to make sure that the mortgage is getting paid every month. And they wanna make sure that you have enough above and beyond the mortgage payment that even if something comes up unexpected, which it will at some point in some months, that you still have the ability to pay the debt service. That's, that's everything that they're worried about. They don't wanna take the property back. That doesn't work well for them. It doesn't look good on their books. It doesn't look good for their underwriting department who makes decisions about what loans to make. So it's bad news for them if they have to take back a property. So it's really common to see have a lender say, we have a minimum DSCR or debt service coverage ratio of say 1.25, all right? And what that means is, uh, let's say that your mortgage payment was 10, just make the numbers easy, $10,000, all right? Or if it was 10, this is usually done on an annual basis. So uh, annual, monthly, whatever. Let's say you have a mortgage payment of $10,000. To have a 1.25 coverage ratio means you need to have net income of 12,500. So what that means to the lender is not only can you cover the full 10,000, but you have an extra 2,500 as a buffer. Okay. And that's usually done on an annual basis, which means 10,000 doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you're talking about a little duplex. But um, anyway, so that's debt service coverage ratio. Okay. I thought that's over the homework. Okay. I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to go find that other calculator and I'm going to show you guys 
how some of this plays out. Uno momento. Oop, not there. Okay, pull that up, share my screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is a, I called my quick analysis calculator, just an Excel, an Excel sheet that I put together that allows you to just very quickly punch a couple numbers in and see whether this is this deal is even worth like exploring or looking further into. All right, so in this section here, and what I'll do is, I don't know that I have this in Google Sheets yet, but I'll check and if not, I'll put it into Google Sheets and then I will share the, uh, the link to this so that you guys can use it. Yeah. Okay, so what it has here in, in orange, or might show up as yellow on your computer, is these are the inputs. So, you have purchase price, down payment percentage, interest rate, amortization period, number of units, and average monthly rent. All right, so the purchase price would be, when you're using this, would be the asking price, like how much are they asking for the property? Down payment is how much of a down payment are you gonna do? Now, depending on the type of property, it's going to impact the amount of down payment. So this might be more realistic to be 25%. You know, right now, if you're going for apartment buildings, um, if you're going for smaller ones, you might be able to get it at 20%. And also, depending on what's going on in the, the lending environment, that number can be quite a bit different. All right. It used to be long ago, you could get it for only 10%. I doubt we're going to see that right now. All right, interest rate. So whatever, whatever the market interest rate is that you're that you're talking to your lenders about. Uh, amortization period. So the thing about amortization period that's interesting is when you're dealing in the um, residential sector sector of multifamily, two to four units having a 30 year amortization period is, is normal. That's the most common thing you see. When you get into the commercial sector or five plus units, you'll see more of a 25 year amortization period. And for those of you, if you don't know what amortization period means is, amortization period is the period of time that they spread the loan payments out over, which then helps you figure out what your payment is going to be. So on a regular, if you're thinking of your personal residence, you probably have a, have a 30 year, fully amortized loan and what that means is on day one your bank is figuring out okay so if we're going to hold this loan for 30 years at four and a half percent interest or five percent interest whatever the interest rate is then in order for it to be paid down to zero the principal balance at year 30 or a month 360 the payments have to be this much okay so x amount so every month so when you're doing a little amortization calculator or which, you know, I'm an Excel nerd, so I do those kind of things, is you start off and you basically build out 360 months. And what we're doing is we're taking each payment and it applies first to the interest. So if you think about it, let's say you're getting a loan for $500,000, right? The interest on a $500,000 loan is going to be the highest that it's going to be during the life of the loan. Because once you make your first payment on it, which will be principal and interest, now your payment or now your principal balance is 499,630, know, all right, something like that. So now your interest payment is based on that amount. And the next month when you make your payment, now your principal balance is $499,003 or whatever. Okay, so every month your principal balance goes down. This might be super, seem super basic to some of you, but some of you might be like, wow, I just actually don't really had never thought about it. So I just want everybody to be kind of on the same page. So every month your principal balance is going down and by the end of month 360, on a 360 month amortization period, the balance would be zero. So that's why every month you're making a higher and higher principal payment because your interest is getting lower because the balance is getting lower. Anyway, that's all the stuff going on behind the scenes. In the multifamily world, five plus units, 25 years is actually more the norm that we see. I have seen 30 year occasionally, but 25 is more average. But the reason these are in, orange right now is because you can make those adjustments. Now this calculator was done in Excel, which means I'm able to lock the cells so that you don't accidentally delete them. But when I put them into Google Sheets, it, Google Sheets doesn't have the cells locked. So just know, if you take it, you'll, you'll download it, you're open it up, you're gonna make a copy of it. 
if you accidentally delete anything that's not in orange, you're going to want to go re-download it unless you know how to build the calculation back in. Or make sure you do undo, control Z. Because otherwise your calculator won't work anymore because the formulas will be gone. But let's, let's go down into this a little bit. All right, then you have number of units. So when you're doing like a full-on analysis, you're probably going to have, if you have eight units, you're probably going to have some at 600, some at 675, maybe one or two at 725. So you probably have a, a blend. So what you're doing when you're doing this a quick analysis is you're just taking the total amount of monthly rent divided by the number of units to come up with an average monthly rent, just so it fits in the calculator so that you can do something quick with it. So what this tells you down here is the down payment amount. So if I'm buying it for 340 and I'm putting 25% down, the down payment would be $85,000. Okay, so that gives you an idea capitalization wise, like how much money you need to be prepared for on the down payment. Now I'm not, I'm not building in, this is a very, very quick analysis calculator. I'm not building in things like the closing costs and the lending costs and things like that. So just know this is a very quick calculation just to see whether it's worth it to dive deeper into the actual analysis on the property. And this is not a calculator that you would use when you're figuring out your absolute final, how much money do I need to bring in the closing? All right, that's a little bit of a caveat. <clears throat> All right, and then this would be the loan amount, which is basically the purchase price minus the down payment. So we're talking about a loan amount of 255 in this case. All right, so here we have net operating income. All right, so the income is 60,480. So this is calculated by taking the number of units times the average monthly rent. Now what I did is I built in a 10% vacancy. Now the actual building you buy may or may not be that high. So this is just giving you some kind of thing, well, let's throw in 10% just to be realistic. Your buildings aren't usually completely full all the time. Even if you have one unit turnover, it's rare that you have somebody out on the 30th and have somebody in on the first. There's usually some amount of time. So you build in a little bit of vacancy factor uh, just in case you do have some vacancy throughout the year. Uh, under expenses, we're just doing an assumption of 40% expenses. Now the actual expenses can vary greatly. It depends on a lot of things. Um, how old is the building? So how much maintenance are they typically having? The size of the building. Um, expenses, as you get larger and larger in buildings, there's a lot of expenses that you have um, that as a percentage of the total rents end up going down. Like for example, property management. Because there's efficiencies that you recognize when you get into larger and larger properties. Okay, so the percentage of expenses is gonna vary greatly, but as a quick number, we just throw in 40% so that you can see you know, if it was 40%, what would we be looking at, right? It's a good kind of mid-range. I have seen properties that have gone up to even 50 and 60%. That's typically when you have a situation where it's all the utilities are included. So maybe the rents are higher than they would have been, but the expenses are also higher. So the net income ends up being comparable, but sometimes the expenses as a percentage might be higher. So if you know that going into it, you could make an adjustment here to see what, what it would look like, all right? But 40 will at least get you in the ballpark. So you have your net operating income, which is just a function of your income minus expenses. And then over here on the right, I wrote out net income minus expenses or income minus expenses to tie this in, All right? These calculations are going to become like your go-tos. All right, our next one is annual cash flow. So our annual cash flow is going to be our net operating income, so income minus expenses, minus the mortgage payments, okay, or debt service. So our debt service is based on our loan amount, taking into account the interest rate and the amortization period. Okay, so it's a calculation that takes this into account, and this is the annual debt service. So the annual cash flow is your net operating income minus the debt service. So for example, I'm gonna show you how some of these numbers can change. Let's say that, we'll leave the purchase price the same for now, but let's say that we had a 6.5% interest rate. We'll just change that one thing so you can kind of see. So I want you to watch net, I haven't actually hit enter yet. I want you to watch the net operating income. Let me see if I can scroll it out a little bit so you can see both. Oh, almost. It's a little bit smaller. Oh, well, let me do while we're sharing it. Okay, that's all right. So when I hit enter, net operating income, does it change? No, it doesn't change because the interest rate or the debt service isn't part of net operating income. So the fact that I make a change that impacts debt service, it doesn't change the net operating income. So let's undo that. Oh, maybe now that I'm not live in it, it'll let me shrink it. Yes, okay, there we go. And now look at 
annual cash flow. So let's put it up to 6.5. So right, so right now, annual cash flow is at 17,497. So if we change the interest rate and increased it, first of all, what, what direction do you expect the annual cash flow to go if I'm gonna increase the interest rate? Do you expect to go up or down? Right, we expect to go down. So let's see, it goes from 17,000 down to 15,000. Okay, and that makes sense, right? Because now our cost of our money is higher, so that's gonna drive our cash flow down. All right, so back to 5.5. .5. All right, so let's say what we're looking at a building that is, has a purchase price of a million. All right, and okay, let's just, oops, sorry, probably gonna have to have more units. All right, so let's say we're dealing with, these numbers necessarily make a ton of sense, but let's say we're dealing with 25 units with an average monthly rent of, let's say 600. Okay, so if we have 25 units, it's average rent of 600, they're asking a million dollars, we're gonna put down 25%, let's say it's five and a half percent interest, 25 years, okay? So we're just playing with different numbers. Now our net operating income is, you know, near $100,000. If we have debt service at five and a half percent over 25 years on the $750,000 loan balance, our cash flow would be about $42,000 a year. Okay, so anytime you change any of these numbers, it's gonna flow through to give you an idea all part of where it's gonna come in. Now, something that we're looking at is gonna be the cash on cash return on the down payment. And I'm gonna put everything kind of back to where it was. All right, so cash on cash, return on down payment. So what this is doing, this is just simply saying, if you were gonna put down that 25%, which would be in this case, $85,000, what is the, the return on your investment for putting that money up? All right, so again, we're not taking into account uh, lender costs and down payment, and all of that is real, and that would be part of it. It just, it, it adds another layer of complexity that you'll absolutely be ready for once you get a little bit deeper, but I'm just not gonna bog us down with it when you're learning the basics. Okay, so cash on cash is going to be your annual cash flow, so that's 17,000, divided by the down payment of 85,000, right? So in this case, that would be about a 20% return on your money. So what you're evaluating, for example, let's say that you were like, well, I mean, what would it be if I wanted to put down 50% down payment? What would that look like? Well, my NOI would go up to 36,000, my cash flow would go up to 23,000 my cash on cash return would go down from 20% to 14%. Why is that? Usually, not usually, just the law of leverage in general in real estate and why so many people will use debt to finance real estate is because the return on investment goes up. The higher you leverage, the higher your return on investment is. It's just, it's a mathematical fact. So when you're evaluating, if you, have ca if you don't have the cash, then it doesn't really matter. It's not much of a decision. But if you do have the cash and you're trying to decide, am I going to take this money and do one deal and be at only 50% leverage and have 23000 coming in for cash flow and make 14% of my money? Or am I going to take that money and I'm going to spread it out over two deals? Let's say I'm getting the, the two identical deals and have lower cash flow on each deal but a higher return on my investment. Is that what I want to do? And there's no right or wrong. It just, it just simply gives you information so you can make a decision. And it's not, the decision isn't always financial for everyone as far as like return. Not everybody's goal is to have the maximum return. It depends on a lot of things. Where are you at in your life? What are you valuing? Do you value more cash flow coming in? Do you value not owing the bank as much? Like there's, sometimes there's things that aren't tied to maximum profitability, but that impacts you just in a different way, emotionally or just based on the business principles you've learned or your family principles. Like some people are just like, yeah, I just, I don't want to have a lot of debt, but I can't pay all cash for it. So fine, you can put more of a down payment. But the way it typically works is you're, you're usually trying to get maximum leverage for the bank because that allows you to take whatever funds you have and get the most impact from it. All right, so let's put this back to 25. Okay, so in this particular case, that would be a 20% return. And the more of a down payment you put, the lower your, your cash on cash return is, but the higher your cash flow is. That's always gonna be inverse relationship between cash flow and uh, return on investment on your down payment. All right, and then cap rate. Cap rate, short for capitalization rate, is your net operating income 
divided by the purchase price. Okay, so in this case, we have 10.67. So if we went and, let's just say we increased the purchase price to 400,000. So that's the only thing that we changed. Okay, so the cash flow went down a little bit. Cash flow went down a little bit, but why? The net operating income didn't change at all, right? It was the same as it was before. The annual cash flow went down because the mortgage payment went up. And the mortgage payment went up because the purchase price went up. And because the purchase price went up, the loan went up. And since annual cash flow includes your debt service, that's what drove the cash flow down. All right, and, I, and maybe this seems a little bit redundant to talk all these things. I just, I want you guys to understand kind of how the relationships weave through all of these numbers and all of these things. All right, and then our cash on cash return, the down payment went up to 100,000 if we're putting down 25% of 400,000. And since our annual cash flow is only 14,000 now, our cash on cash return is at 14%. Still not a bad return, right? But our cap rate is now at 9%. So you'll be able to see, like one of the ways you can use this calculator is, let's say that the original asking price of this was 500,000. Let's just say that was it. So when you looked at the listing, you're like 500,000, let me plug in some quick numbers and just see, like is this deal even worth looking at? You look at, come down here and go, ah, it's only 6.9%. Um, oops, not that one, cap rate. It's only a 7.26% cap rate. Like, uh, I really want, don't wanna do anything that's less than an 8% 8, 8 cap rate. So let me just play with this a little bit and see what, what purchase price would give me an 8% cap rate, assuming the income and expenses are what we've put in here. That's always the assumption you have to make. The only time you're gonna go dig in and, and do a ton of analysis on it is if you've actually made the offer and got it accepted. Otherwise, initially when you're making your offer, you're making a lot of assumptions because oftentimes your offer is not accepted. So the more time you're spending analyzing it to death, the more time you're probably just taking away from finding more deals because a lot of times you'll make the offer the seller and be like, no, I wanted what I wanted. And they're just, if they're not motivated, they're not going to accept it. So you want to do something that's fairly quick. All right, so if I was like, let me see what purchase price would give me an 8% and then we'll go from there. And like, so, I'm going to tie this into something that you guys might be able to connect. If you've been watching our live at five in our, on our passive income page, you've heard me talking about Vomsi, who is in our, uh, she's on our one-on-one -on -one coaching program for apartments. Anyway, she ended up finding, it wasn't an apartment building, but she ended up finding a portfolio of 12 townhouses. But it's, it's very similar to an apartment deal in that they're under, they're basically two, two buildings. You got a building of seven townhouses and a building of five townhouses. They're all individually uh, parceled, so she could sell them off individually if she wanted to, but that wasn't her goal. So when she originally got that deal in, she was looking at it, and it had the asking price was nine hundred and twelve thousand. So she looked down at the cap rate and was like, "Hmm, uh, there's no way I can offer nine hundred and twelve thousand." So she used this calculator to figure out what number to offer to the seller. Okay, so I'm going to show you how we do this. So I want this to be eight percent. It's at seven point two six percent right now. So I'm just going to play with this purchase price. So I can figure out like, well, what, what would I offer? So let me try 475,000 and see what that does. Okay. So 475,000, it brings us up to 7.6. Okay. So I'm getting closer. Let's try 450,000. Okay. So at 450,000, that would be an 8% cap rate. And if you were like, well, I mean, 8% is great, but I really want, well, I want to see what it'd be at nine. I really want to try to get a 9% cap rate. Whatever it is that is your investing objective, you play with this until that hits that price. And then you know, after just doing some number crunching, that your offer price is going to need to be this. Okay, so it just kind of quickly helps you figure out where you want to be coming in with the offer to see if the seller is even going to be remotely interested in having a conversation about that. Right. And sometimes you'll see the number you put in here is like 60% of what they're asking. So in that case, it helps you to kind of quickly eliminate, okay, there's no way someone's going to consider, you know, my half price offer. So I'm not going to bother spending any more time on it. So quickly you can say, oh, okay, yeah, we are really, really far off. But if I look at it, I'm like, oh, they're asking 500,000. I could come in at 450 and no, it's 50,000 lower than what they're asking. But, oh, you know, I'll throw it in and see what happens. All right. So that's cap rate. Now, debt service coverage ratio is what we we're talking about, that the banks want to see that you have net operating income above and beyond the mortgage payment by a certain amount. Now, it's interesting because I talked to, uh, 
I think that's actually a mortgage broker, but he had a really specific loan program. Now this is before COVID. So he and I are, are slated to have a conversation and, you know, kind of catch up on what's like, what's current, like what he has that's current. But when I talked to him a few months ago, he was like, yeah, we actually have a, a 90% rental program. It was super interesting, super complicated. I recorded the interview and I put it in a, I, I think I put it up on YouTube. Anyway, I, I think it's it's somewhere out in the public. I put it in our, our course for our students, but I think it's on YouTube as well. It was kind of an interesting one, but he was like, yeah, it's, um, it's a 30 year amortized amortization loan that has a, uh, a balloon at 20 years, something like that has first 10 years is interest only, but we'll loan up to 90% with a DSCR at 1% or at one. And I was like, what? I never heard of that before. So like what that would mean is the debt service coverage ratio, they just want to make sure that their mortgage payment is, it, is the same as the net operating income. To me, that's insane because that's hugely risky on, this, on the, uh, the lender's part, but that's what he was explaining. The lender he has was willing to do that then. Highly unlikely that's the case now, but, uh, but that's how that related. So normally, any conversation I've ever had with a lender, the DSCR is usually a minimum of 1.2. I've seen minimum of 1.3. Now, in practicality, that number, the higher it is, the happier the bank is, and they tend to uh, give you a better deal, a better rate when it has a higher DSCR because overall it's going to be a lower risk for them. So for example, when we did our portfolio refinance last year, our DSCR, well, depending on the amount of the loan, but our DSCR was ranging between 1.5 and 1.6. So I, cause I, we weren't trying to pull out the max cash. I actually prefer to have more cash flow and have more room. So, but if I had pulled out more of the cash, I'd have more, you know, cash sitting in our bank, but my debt service coverage ratio would be lower. So my interest rate was going to be a little bit higher. So one of the decisions I had to make is I'm evaluating which loan we're going to take from them because we had several options. I looked at, okay, well, if I, if I take this lower LTV, which means I'm not pulling out as much, I get rewarded with a lower interest rate, which also helps the DSCR. So these, all these things are like moving around, but the bank looks at that and goes, okay, the higher that is, the more comfortable we feel because we know you should always be able to cover the mortgage. Plus you have this nice fat reserve that's coming in every month for when something comes up that was unexpected. All right. So DSCR, the higher it is, the better it is, but most lenders will have like a minimum number that they want to see. And you're going to calculate that by looking at your NOI and comparing that to your debt service. So anyway, that's the, that's the calculator. So you can take it, play with all, play with the numbers. It's kind of see where things fall and then get a, get a better idea. Let me just start sharing. Okay. All right. So now that we laid that foundation, let's talk about your homework. Okay. So here's your homework for today. Day four, I want you to run a deal or not a run a deal, find a deal and it can be online. So like it could be something that you see on LoopNet where you actually see some numbers or if you got any deal flow in from a broker that had numbers with it. So I don't care what the source of the deal is. I just want you to practice running the numbers. Okay. So I want you to run the numbers and I want you to identify the NOI. Now I'm going to give you guys access to the calculator, but I do not want you to use it for this homework. I don't care if you use it after you've done the homework to see, but I want you to do it by hand. And the reason I want you to do it by hand is when you have to actually do the calculations out and piece it together, that's how you actually understand. I'm not a fan of education for the, for the sake of just learning it. You, it's always, okay, here's something to learn. Now go do it. And let's make sure you actually understand it. Cause if you don't understand it, then cool. Then at least we know, well, what's missing and what can we fill in there? All right, so I want you to run the numbers and identify the net operating income or NOI. I want you to identify the cap rate. I want you to calculate the cash flow. And I want you to calculate the DSCR, debt service coverage ratio. All right, so I want you to do those things first. And once you've done that, if you want to go double check it, in the calculator, you can do that. Now, it actually probably won't give you the same answer because remember the calculator has a few uh, assumptions in there about vacancy and about expenses. So you might have to actually type over those 
in the calculator in order to match what you saw online or from the broker. So just know there's a, you might have to make some adjustments there. And then you could undo it to put the formulas back in. All right, so everyone clear on your homework? So just, even if you just do it for one property, if you have some time and you have more than one property to do it on, the more you practice, the better experience you'll get at it and you'll, be, you'll just get quicker and quicker at it. All right. All right, so do we have any questions? Today I only have about 10 minutes so that one o'clock we're going on in the passive income group. For those of you who are in the apartments group, if you, uh, Jennifer and I own the passive income group and we work with Nathan in the apartments group. So if you guys just want to have access to a little bit more of what we do, you can uh, come over to the passive income group there also. A lot of what we do is the same in, in both groups, but we're just more active in our passive income group just because that's been our community for the last six months that we've grown from scratch. So um, at, today at one o'clock, I'll be doing an interview with Robin Scoville about well, I actually don't even know what we're going to be talking about. He's just probably one of the most interesting characters I've ever met, but I trained him as a brand new investor in 2007 and he's, um, he's just become like a mogul, a real estate mogul at this point and done really, really cool projects. So I'm interviewing him on our passive income page at one o'clock. So anyway, so I only have a little bit of time for questions today, but I'll do more of an open Q and A tomorrow because there's, I don't have anything scheduled after, after our thing tomorrow. So, all right, let me, if you have a question, go ahead and, Oh, let me answer the questions that are in the chat real quick. Oh, Sean, is anything happening? Sorry, Sean. All right, um, Trisha, the calculator's in the Facebook group already. Yeah, I'm gonna put it with, thank you, Trisha. We're gonna, I'm gonna put it with this um, video in the unit so it's easy for you guys to find. Um, Ali, can I explain LTV again? Oh, thank you for that question, yes. So loan to value is, and it, it can be a little bit confusing because when you're talking to different lenders, sometimes they use it differently. So I'm going to explain the, the few different variations that you can navigate through those conversations when they come up. Loan to value is um, the amount of the loan they're giving you compared to the purchase price. So that's why the word value is a little bit confusing because sometimes like the actual value and what you're paying are not necessarily the same, but they'll use the word value to mean the purchase price, for example. Let's say that the purchase price is $1 million, okay? So if you're getting a 70% LTV loan, that means the loan would be 700,000. If you're getting an 80% LTV loan, that means the loan would be 800,000. So it's, bring, let's pull it down to 100,000. Let's say the loan is $100,000, right? It's a 75% loan to value, your loan would be 75,000. 60% loan to value would be 60,000. So it's basically just what percentage the loan is of that. Um, another way that people will explain that same thing is loan to cost. And depending on what kind of lender you're talking to, if you're talking to a hard money lender, oops, because you're going to do um, the Burr strategy, they might say LTC or loan to cost. And it's the exact same thing. Sometimes people say loan to value and they're actually referring to the amount of a loan compared to the after renovation value. And that's why I say it can be a little bit confusing because they all use it. The lenders all use it differently depending on what kind of lender they are. So for example, on that one, let's say that the after rehab value was gonna be 150,000, all right, but you're buying it for 80,000 and you're putting 20,000 into it. And then it's gonna be worth, once you've done all that renovation, it's gonna be worth 150,000. So if they say, well, we will not give you a loan for more than 65% loan to value, and they're referring to the ARV, we would look at, or the after rehab value, we would say, okay, one, so I'm just looking down at my calculator, we'd say 150,000 times 0.65, and that means the maximum loan that they could give on that property would be 97,500. It would be 65% of the after rehab value. So that tends to play more of a role when you're doing renovation and they're looking at not only what is it worth right now, but what is it going to be worth after you did the renovation? So, but they might say, they might use the same word. They might say LTV. Where someone else's LTV doesn't mean the after rehab value, it means the purchase price. So if you're ever talking to a lender and it's, if it's a rehab project, then you for sure want to clarify that with them because they could be, they could mean either one. And you're like, uh, which one do you mean? So you just always ask questions of clarification 
And if you're not sure, you could always use numbers. Say, okay, so if I'm buying it for this amount and I'm putting this much into it and it's gonna be worth this, what would my loan amount be? Just so you can make sure that you understood what they were saying. Cause like, there's nothing worse than moving forward thinking, okay, my loan amount's gonna be this, so I'm gonna need this much down payment. And then you get a week from closing and you start getting information about how much loan, how much you need to put down. And you realize you misunderstood what they meant. And now you need an extra many tens of thousands of dollars to put down. And you're like, ah, I wasn't planning on that, right? So it's really important that you always seek to clarify things at the highest level. And one of the things that's really common when, when people are new in real estate, uh, and I don't know what the le what level all of you guys are at. So some of you might be new, some of you might be experienced, but when you're new in real estate, sometimes the concern is, I don't want anyone to think I'm stupid. I don't want anyone to, to think I'm new. So I don't want to ask a lot of questions because I'm afraid it's going to, you know, it's going to make it obvious that I'm new. And I understand that. And I totally get that. And when it comes to agents and brokers, I agree. You want to, as much as you can, come across as the experienced investor, right? So that's why, like, you got to practice, practice, practice. But when it comes to the lender, there's no value in pretending you know if you don't know because they're only going to make the loan to you based on your actual experience that you can prove. So you coming across as more experience, it doesn't matter. Like their loan programs, just they are what they are based on the experience you have. So do not be afraid to ask questions. I, I always joke that I'm such a, I'm so analytical and I have to get so in the weeds to understand something to begin with. Uh, but, so it's very hard to teach me because I'm like, but what about this? What about that? What about that? Right? It's super annoying, but it is what it is. The reason I know as much as I know, I have so much like seemingly random information and how everything ties together is because when I was new, I would ask question after question after question after question because one, just because I didn't understand and I needed to know all the pieces to get it. But I was an avid question asker and it really served me because one, I wasn't sitting there in a fog of, I don't understand things because I'm afraid to ask because I was like, no, I have to ask because otherwise I don't get it. So don't be afraid to ask questions. No one is upset about it. No one thinks anything less about you, but the title company is a great one to ask questions to because they really don't care at all. I mean, you're talking to someone who's making their hourly wage to, you know, it's just a regular job. Um, so they have no judgment on you. So ask a lot of questions at the closing, ask a lot of questions at the lender because you get to take that knowledge forward with you on every deal. And so you learn way faster if you just, lots of questions. Um, Freddie, should we be checking our strength of offer in apartments and multifamily the same way you do for flips? Sure, you can. I, I don't have that as part of the that calculator, but yeah, if you know you're making a really, really low offer and you're like, yeah, that I would I would make so you yeah, you can check your, your strength of offer. Sure. It's not it's not a decision point when I'm doing it, so that's why it's not on the calculator, but just being realistic about whether I should even bother my broker. Um you can look at that. And so for those of you who are wondering, like, what is, like, what is strength of offer? Strength of offer is your offer price divided by the asking price. So you're just looking to see like, well, how, how is this going to be received on the, on the, from the seller side? That's a great question. Hey, I like your shirt. So Freddie and I both, I, for, for many years, some of you guys already know this. Actually, I see Min. Oh, hey, Joe and Min. I see you guys on here. Um, so for the past five years, uh, I, I worked at a, a place called um, the Nick Fertucci Real Estate Academy, and I was as well one of the lead trainers and spoke at our bus tours and like just living my best life, doing what I absolutely love, teaching and training and stuff. So, um, but it required that I traveled. I was traveling 15 to 20 days a month. So that's uh, you know my kids are getting all older. I have three eight-year-olds now and a six-year-old that just became not uh, not very family friendly. So in order for me to do be able to do what I meant to do and do what I love, I had to figure out how to how do I do that, but not be, you know, traveling around the country? So Freddie, uh, he also worked at the company. So I was super excited to see him here. Makes my heart happy. Anyway, um, do we have any other, I probably have time for like maybe one more question. Oh, Allie, I just see what you said. I'm a crazy question asker. Yes, you should be. Good, do it. Um, any other questions? All right, so homework. Calculate those numbers. I'll put it, it might not be for several hours, but I'll put this recording up in the, uh, in the unit section so that you guys have it. Uh, tomorrow we'll be meeting. And so tomorrow we're gonna do
just like what does it look like to make a first offer and like, like what's the form of that look like so we're going to go through that and then we're going to have um kind of an open longer q a so we can do questions on any of the things that we've talked about so if you have questions write them down we'll talk about those tomorrow and then um you know just kind of talk about what your next steps are and what you need to do to keep this ball rolling so um anyway it's been an honor and a pleasure if you guys can make it at one o'clock in the passive income group jennifer's not here right now otherwise she could probably do a watch party in the apartment group maybe i could figure it out i, I don't know I, I don't think my brain can handle that many things at once but if you want to come in watch that interview with robin I, without a doubt it's going to be informative and probably really entertaining because he is a very unique human being at every every imaginable level so it's going to be a fun interview and and uh, I'm sure he's gonna have some, some stuff to teach you guys along the way. So anyway, all of you guys have an amazing, amazing rest of today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, same time, and um, have a good one. Bye.